Welcome back. This is a short chapter. It's really just cool stuff happened a long time ago. A lot of the thinking that made up all of the innovation of the Industrial Revolution had actually been around for a really long time. So before we look at powering up during the Industrial Revolution, I want to have a chapter where we look at really old technologies and appreciate how present they are in our world today. How much of what industrial design might be for us is actually present in some older things. That brain quality that makes an industrial designer today might be something that's been around forever and I think we can see it in some things I'd like to show you. And then later we'll look at how they got used together in concert with power added to do things that look a little more familiar. This slide shows worm gears. On the left from Leonardo, in the middle from the Shakers, and on the right available somewhere in some catalog now. Same idea, different materials, totally wide range of time periods. So let's look at evidence of some of these cool ideas that are old. Maybe it's engineering, maybe it's design, you decide. I've organized this chronologically, so I'm totally skipping around the world and through different eras in a kind of reckless way. I'm just showing you some highlights of things I've collected over time that I think are interesting to look at. Remember that even just the concept of time is invented. We designed that. The Earth tells us the seasons. The movement of the sun tells us the days, and even part of a day. But what if we invented something we wanted to happen at the same time every day, like prayer, for example? So first we invent God, then we invent the concept of prayer, then we figure out we need to standardize our approach to prayer by keeping track of time. So we invent this thing called time, and then we invent a device to do it. There's lots of design activity involved in telling time. This is the Karnak Clepsidra, which is an Egyptian water clock. So water clocks work by filling up a reservoir with water, and then a regulator at the bottom allows the water to drip out in a controlled way. And the concentric rings on the inside, or the dots or the lines, let you see what time it is. So if you fill the reservoir with water at noon, when the sun is telling you what time it is, you'll be able to keep track of the time throughout the course of the evening. Time is essentially a design solution to a user-generated problem and they're ancient and they exist around the world. The Chinese introduced water clocks around 4000 BC, but most ancient cultures had some version of a water clock. And amazingly, this was the most reliable method of telling time all the way up until the pendulum was introduced in the 18th century. So we had lots of other ways to tell time, but they weren't that reliable. One of the greatest early engineers was Archimedes. Many of his innovations are still around today and fueling the way our world operates. He was a Greek mathematician and physicist and astronomer. Archimedes is credited with introducing a number of things that you are familiar with. The lever, the screw pump, the catapult, the concept of pie. Not delicious pie, but thinky pie. I wonder who invented pie eating pie. They deserve an award. The Archimedes screw is essentially a screw in a cylinder, a captured screw, and so instead of driving into something, it pulls water up. They were used throughout the world by cultures that needed to move water from the river into the farmlands. You couldn't rely on just the strip of land next to the river to produce enough food, so moving water away from the river into farmland was a really important part of agrarian living, and the Archimedes screw made that possible. There are so many great images of Archimedes screws in action, on the lower left is a woodcut from Vitruvius from 1511. In the middle on the bottom is a Pompeian fresco from about 70 AD. And on the right is an Egyptian terracotta figurine from about 30 BC. So lots of evidence of the Archimedes screw in action. They're still in our world today. This is a wastewater treatment plant in Memphis, Tennessee that uses seven Archimedes screws, each 100 inches across. And they lift 20,000 gallons of wastewater a minute. So where would we be without this device? Also, the picture on the bottom shows a schematic of injection molding. The Archimedes screw fuels all injection molding processes. There's a hopper with plasticized pellets. The pellets are gravity fed into the screw, which is tapered and heated, so it compresses the plastic as it melts it, and it forces it through the sprue into the mold. So without an Archimedes screw, no plastic anything. Also, if you take that Archimedes screw, and instead of having it elongated and contained in a cylinder, you flatten it, 
you get a screw propeller. We didn't figure that out for many, many centuries, but it's the way we then moved everything through the water, and it's the way we move many things through the air as well. Also, look at the picture in the middle of the propeller from the Mauritania, which we'll talk about again in a few weeks. Look at the tiny little people to give you a sense of scale. If we move from 200s BC Greece to about 70 in Alexandria, we can look at the work of Heron. Heron designed the aeolopile, which is the Greek word for wind ball. And it's really the first steam motor. It's a very simple device. It's a sphere with one hole at the top. So you fill it with water and you heat it up. As the water turns to steam, it needs to escape because the volume increases. So it's forced out the hole and through the tubes that then create motion. This didn't do anything. It was just delightful. But it's the same basic principle as steam power that fueled the Industrial Revolution. Heron was a mathematician and an engineer, and he published two books called Pneumatica that featured his mechanical designs that used water and air and steam pressure to create movement. And that movement often powered amazing things. On the left is an altarpiece. The water in the reservoir boils, and then that steam moves up through the figures, animating them. And what they do is dump some chemical compound or some minerals on the fire, creating an explosion or smoke or color, which would have amazed people watching this. And on the lower right is a wind-powered organ that plays music all by itself. It would be easy for you to look at this and think this is old-fashioned stuff and has nothing to do with our world, but 90% of our energy today is still generated with steam power. Nuclear power plants produce steam and then advanced turbines turn that steam into motion and into power. Heron also invented the very first vending machine, and that vending machine sold holy water. People who had money were royalty or the church. Heron went to work for the church and did some really interesting projects. These are enormous bronze doors, much too heavy for people to open, but they're connected to an engineering installation underneath the temple. So the priest would light the fire and say an incantation. He knew how long it would take so he could pace his prayer for the water to boil turn to steam, transfer into another reservoir, and then that weight was used to rotate cylinders that would open the doors automatically, revealing the goddess inside. It must have been really astounding. There are also lots of ancient innovations that are not about mechanics, but are just about making better tools for practical use. This is the Chinese wheelbarrow introduced around 100 BC. Europe didn't get a wheelbarrow for another thousand years until around 1100 or 1200. And the European wheelbarrow is like the one that I have in my backyard. It's not balanced around a central wheel. There's a wheel in front, and you have to work really hard to lift the load. The Chinese wheelbarrow is focused on a central wheel much higher up. So once you've loaded it, it's exponentially easier to steer and to wheel for long distances. And why we don't have those now, I don't know. Many of the ideas we have today about mass production are also evident in ancient China. Most people are familiar with the magic army of Emperor Qin. It's over 8,000 terracotta soldiers, all made by hand and really incredibly impressive in their volume. The bodies are all made of coil, but the head and the hands were all made in molds. They were popped out in production and then altered later to look unique. So I find that really fascinating that they had the brain power and the technology and the ability to make things in repeat but chose to then alter them to look unique. As part of the unification of China, currencies were unified and standardized coins were made. And I mentioned this in the timeline in the first video. Economists and historians talk about that in relation to its importance in unifying all of the warring tribes of China into one empire. But I love it because it's evidence of repeat standardized manufacturing. To look at the tree that's, that's used to press in and create the mold, and then the sprued coins that are molded in that mold and then cut off to produce endless repeat exactly the same coins is really inspiring. Also, coins everywhere else were valuable for the metal content. The silver or the gold established the value of the coin. In this case, the bronze has very little value. It's given value by the molding and the stamping of the characters, which is essentially a contract with the new government saying, we will give you this much value for this coin. That's the way all of our currency works today, and here it was working in ancient China in 200 BC. So this is manufacturing and modularity in a fascinating way, but it's also economics in a really modern way. 
I'm including this object mostly because it has dragons and frogs, and who doesn't want to look at more dragons and frogs? I don't know if it actually existed or actually worked, but it's a famous object designed by Chang Heng around 132. It's a seismograph. It's a cast bronze device that on the outside is this wonderful fantasy of dragons and frogs communing, but on the inside has a reverse pendulum that's very sensitive, and if tripped by seismic activity, it tips one direction or the other and allows the dragon to release its ball into the frog's mouth. So it shows the direction of seismic activity, and the thinking was that this could allow a centralized government to send aid somewhere before they even received word that aid was needed. Whether or not it existed, the level of, I don't know, I hate the word whimsy, but the level of whimsy, of poetry, of narrative storytelling, is something we don't see in design for centuries. I also have to ask myself with ancient things, if there's one of them, does it really count? Is it mass manufacturing? Is it repeatable? So I look for evidence of things made in large quantities. So I look for evidence of things made in large quantities where you can really appreciate how the object was changed to allow it to be made in volume production. This is a great example. The Emperor Shikotu in Japan commissioned one million miniature wooden pagodas. They were distributed to Japan's major temples, and inside the wooden pagoda is a printed paper prayer strip. So one million wooden pagodas and one million printed prayer strips, which were printed first with woodblock type, and then later with cast bronze type. Each cast bronze plate could do about 150,000 slips of paper, so they used eight of these plates to produce them all. I have to look at this wooden part and think about the people making them. Did they make one and then make the next and then make the next? Probably not. They probably cut all of the wood to the same length, turned the outside dimensions the same, marked off where to carve in or used fixed cutting tools that were the right width. There have to have been a lot of concessions made to produce that many of this object. And they exist in museums today, and every time I see one, I'm kind of amazed how exactly alike they are. One of China's most famous engineers, Su Song, did a really interesting job combining utility with poetry. And for me, that's also the sign of some really interesting design work. This is a 30-foot high structure. At the top is a bronze armillary sphere which shows the position of the stars, and inside that is a celestial globe to show the position of the planets. It's a five-story tall pagoda, and on the front are figures that rotate to tell the time and ring bells. The whole thing's powered by a water wheel with an escapement mechanism, and that's technology that the West invented in the 1300s, 300 years later. So some people admire Su Song's thinking for the mechanics. I'm really fascinated by the psychology. Is this merely a public clock? Or is this ever-rotating army of time tellers there to delight me and serve me and help me understand my place in time? Or both? Al Jazari's work in Mesopotamia is in a similar vein as Sue Song's. He made spectacular pieces of engineering that were really astounding. As with Su Song, he published his designs. 50 of his designs were published in 1206. So we have an actual printed record. How we interpret that record leaves some room for speculation, but there are descriptions and images, so we know what these things were. This is the castle clock, which was really made to amaze people. It's a programmable analog computer. It was 11 feet high with a main water reservoir and a float chamber and a flow regulator. So the movement of water moved weight from one place to another and activated this clock. It has multiple functions. It tells the time and the position in the zodiac dial. It has solar and lunar orbit charts. A door opens to reveal a mannequin every hour to tell you the time. And if that's not enough, there are robotic musicians at the bottom, powered by a hidden camshaft attached to a water wheel. There are also two falcons that drop balls into vases. It has a lot to offer. This is Al Jazari's elephant clock, and this video, although very clumsy, has really evocative and useful description of how it works, so I'm going to let that play. Is this a clock, you ask? How does it tell the time? How does it work? I will tell you now. The number of hours since sunrise is shown on the silver and black disc at the top of the clock and the number of minutes into the hour is shown by the scribe's pen. 
The movements of the clock are regulated by a most wonderful mechanism that sits in a tank inside the elephant's body, a perforated floating bowl. There is a small hole in the floating bowl that regulates the speed at which it sinks. As it slowly submerges over half an hour, it tugs via a system of pulleys, the scribe and his pen. When it is completely submerged, the bowl quickly tilts, sinks, and triggers a more dramatic sequence of events. Inside the cupola at the top of the clock, a channel of balls is tilted so that a stopper is lifted to allow one to fall, hitting a fan that turns the phoenix. The ball then drops out of one of the falcon's beaks into the serpent's mouth. As the serpent falls, rotating around its pivot, the weight of the ball tugs a rope that resets the bowl back to the surface of the water. The ball drops again into a vase that triggers the mahout's mallet and hits a cymbal, which sounds a half hour. As the ball collects in a trough, the float begins to submerge again and the whole process repeats itself with subtle adjustments for the second half of the hour. That's amazing, right? On the right of this slide is an image of a contemporary recreation of the elephant clock at a mall in Dubai. I believe it's electric. I think it's all just fake. But still, if you find yourself in Dubai, check it out. Al Jazari was really brilliant at combining very basic mechanisms. This is a really complicated water moving pump, a very, very old mechanism. An arm just goes back and forth. And that back and forth movement in this case is attached to water movement. So the water wheel sits right in the water source moving just by nature and it's turning powers that piston back and forth and that piston pumps water up through pipes and out into the field. So even better than the Archimedes screw, this is self-powering. It uses the flow of the water to create irrigation. And remember, in an agrarian world, whoever has the most water in the most farmland has the most food. And that's a really important advantage. In the West, we invented the suspension bridge. The first one was 1809, right near here where I am in the Merrimack River in Massachusetts. It was 244 feet across. And then the Golden Gate Bridge in the 1930s was 4,200 feet across, becoming one of the greatest symbols of modernity. China did it 800 years before. The Anlan Bridge is 1,050 feet across with eight sections, eight spans. So most design historians talk about the relationship between form and function and modernism being beautifully expressed by suspension bridges. They were one of the first times large-scale engineering gave up on decoration and arrived at a new kind of beauty. I would argue that the Anlan Bridge is equally good evidence of form and function being related and the function creating the aesthetic. As time advanced and new materials became available to engineers and designers, things started to get even more sophisticated. Taki al-Din in Istanbul, modern Turkey, took some of the existing ideas about pump mechanisms and really supercharged them. His pump was published in a book called The Sublime Methods of Spiritual Machines, and he invented lots of mechanisms for moving water. He also invented a steam engine, a good 200 years before that revolutionized steam power in England. This is a pump that again uses the movement of the water pass to power the water wheel. That water wheel powers piston pumps that go up and down, but there's a whole concert of them here working one after the other. So instead of getting a piston with two spurts of water, intermittent water, you get constant water movement because of these pumps. So it's a really big improvement. And we could look at these things all day long. There are so many great examples of cool, smart designs. I want to skip ahead a little bit and look at Pierre Jacques Edros in Switzerland in the 1770s. Because as we got more and more material, and as we got more precision available over time, we began to move past addressing just our needs and started making some amazing things that got out of function and into, I don't know what, more of what we think of as design. The watchmaking and clockmaking industry in Switzerland was so competitive that many clockmakers would make 
other devices to show their skill, singing birds, things that moved. And Pierre Jacques Edros is a great example of this because he really scaled that up. He took his time-telling technologies and repurposed them. This device, it's a little boy who draws pictures, has 6,000 pieces, but it's just mechanical. There's nothing in here that isn't a basic mechanism. They're just used together in a really smart, layered way. And it's those combined behaviors of the mechanisms that make this profound and complex and challenging. This little kid draws better than I do. So what kind of human am I? Jacques Edros used objects to pose questions about what it means to be human. And this helped him sell watches and mechanical birds and other things. But these objects were also seen by kings of Europe and China and India and Japan. They traveled all around the world. They still exist today. They're in a museum and have been restored over the last 10 or 15 years. So we have these beautiful videos of how they actually work inside. And this is another one that writes letters. You can program the disk with what letters you want written, plug the disk in, and then turn it on. And he will write the letters and spaces in the, in the correct sequence. So this doesn't just draw two or three things. You can have it write almost anything you want. Uh, and also, again, better handwriting than I have. This is essentially a programmable computer, right? You can put in any sequence of things you want. Every culture found ways to take mechanical innovation and make something delightful. Add psychology, add some dose of those extra layers of stuff that we think of as part of design that separates it from merely utilitarian problem-solving stuff. Chinese automatons arrived as early as the 1500s, the Japanese became famous for theirs from the 1600s on. On the left is a tea robot. You, put, you wind it up and you put your tea down and the weight of the tea releases the stored energy in the spring and it drives down the table. Do we need our tea delivered down the table automatically by a tea robot? No. Do we want our tea delivered by a robot? Yes. We're going to spend a lot of time this semester looking at that divide between want and need and where designers used to try and take advantage of that to sell more stuff, and how we now need to take advantage of that to sell less stuff, right? We need to satisfy people's wants by giving them things that they also need wrapped up together. On the right is Tanaka's archer, which is an incredibly complicated thing. It can fire a series of arrows at a target. This was produced by Tanaka Hisashigi, who went on to found what became Toshiba. So Toshiba, the great electronics company, has its early roots in mechanical automatons, which I, I love knowing. Some technologies have been around forever, but keep getting improved and re-employed for new challenges. This is going out on a limb a little bit, but over 400 late Neolithic and early Bronze Age spheres, so that's from 3200 to 1500 BC, have surfaced in England, have been found all over England. And there have been many theories about what they are. Are they weapons? Are they ceremonial? Are they prayer beads of some kind? Archaeologist Andrew Young has a different theory that's so exciting to me that I have to share it with you, whether it's true or not. And on the lower right is an image of his students helping him test this theory. He believes that these are communal ball bearings. They're all pretty close to the same size. They all have lobes. So rather than the lobes creating a relief where you could tie a string, he's proposing that these lobes are ways to transfer weight as this rolls because it's almost impossible in this time period to create a sphere. A hand-hewn sphere will be irregular, but those lobes allow that irregularity to uh, average out as, as there's movement. So he had his students replicate the weight of the largest hinge at Stonehenge and drag it on their communal ball bearings to prove that the idea could work. So there's no way we can know if that's what these really were, but there is so much evidence of ball bearings before they could exist that I have to believe it's possible. On the left is Leonardo da Vinci, who proposed ball bearings but didn't have metal as a tool, so he made them out of wood. And he solved the problem of irregularity by putting spacers in between. We weren't really able to make what we know of as a ball bearing today until after World War I, when we could take our manufacturing advances and advance steels and synthetic lubricants to make something that functions the way a ball bearing does in our world. And that's a super clumsy segue to get us to talking about Leonardo for a little while. He's one of the greatest pre-industrial design thinkers whose work overlaps so much with what we do in industrial design. So I want to look at him a little bit. 
And the divide between engineering and design is invisible in his work because he sort of stepped across those boundaries in a way that I think we can learn from. If you're not aware of the Leonardo 3 project, the L3 project, it started in Milan in 2005, and the goal was to digitize all of Leonardo's notebooks because after he died, they were split up. They were actually cut up and split up, and different parts went different places. We're still discovering them. Some were discovered in Germany in a library just a few years ago. And so they're out of order. But also, any of you who keep a sketchbook or a notebook know that you might start thinking about something on Tuesday and then abandon it, and next week, Thursday, go back on another page and work on it some more. So the ideas aren't ever sequential anyway. And what the L3 product was trying to do through high-res scans of his books is knit back together the thread of innovation, the chronology of his innovation. So what's the chronology of his work, but also what's the chronology of his thought? And they found evidence of hundreds and hundreds of mechanical proposals and innovations. And they made animated CAD models of many of those. So it's a really satisfying project for interpreting his drawings. Leonardo looked really closely at nature to understand movement. And that's something that's so important for designers that I find it really inspiring. He wasn't dissecting a horse's leg so he could understand what was inside so he could paint a better horse's leg. He wanted to understand how it worked so he could then use th that natural engineering in manufactured engineering. He designed hundreds of innovations that essentially stored and transferred energy. Because remember, there's no electricity. There's no chemical batteries. If you wanted to create movement or stored power, you needed a mechanical device to do that. And any of you who have tried to use a spring as a power source know that it wants to release all at once. So regulating that release is the challenge. And Leonardo had lots of ideas for how to do that. He also combined his different interests to make some things that really hold up to scrutiny. On the left is a mechanical lion. It's the, a frame of a lion. It probably had a skin over it. We know he made this. It had a clockwork wind-up motor under its stomach. When you wound it up and released it, it walked down the aisle of the church. When it got to the front, it stopped and opened its mouth and delivered a mouthful of lilies to the King of France. I don't know why we needed that, but the King of France must have been pretty delighted to have a lion's stomach worth of lilies automatically delivered. So that's ridiculous, but it's using movement technology of the time to delight. I don't think that's all that different from the Sony Ibo which used our best robotics in 2000 to make a dog that could sit up and bark. Leonardo also proposed a self-propelling cart. We don't know exactly what this was used for. It probably was used to deliver stage scenery on and off a stage, invisibly with no support from people. But it's got a series of gears and a spring that stores energy and a regulator that releases that. You can program its wheels to give it a direction. So essentially, the design brief is to be steered with no intervention from people and remotely powered to create movement. It's not all that different from the Spirit Mars rover, which is our high-tech version of the same thing. There are also a lot of examples of Leonardo using simple mechanisms to solve some pretty big problems. Moving a very heavy bell is made possible with this cart, which has four seats and four people sit on it and turn cranks that have reducing gears that allow their small movement to turn into large movement that turns the wheels. And they can steer it by turning more or less on one side or the other. Leonardo may have been a pacifist, but his notebooks are full of really gruesome war devices. On the top is a rotating tank with cannons, so you never have to be without a cannon to shoot, because as you're shooting out the front, the people in back are loading the cannons up, so they're always ready as they rotate. And you can just ram this forward towards something shooting. And on the bottom is an image that will haunt you. It is horses in the middle who move forward with the rider on them. That movement turns the wheels behind on the chariot. The movement of the turning wheels is transferred to spinning blades in front and behind the horses. So you just get this thing going and you ram it into a crowd of people and you slice them all up. Remember that Leonardo had to make money and the people who had money needed to fight each other. So he did a lot of design for kings, and a lot of that was war equipment. War equipment often shows evidence of really interesting design work. Emperor Qin unified China in 221 BC because he had better raw materials than all the other countries. As a result, he could make swords that were 30% longer. 
If you have 30% longer sword, you can kill people at 30% greater distance. I'm not sure if I have that math right, but you get the point. Longer sword, more killing. Also, the arrows were redesigned to have interchangeable parts. The, the tips were all cast to be the same, and the shafts were unified. So any archer could use any arrow. Before that, every archer made their own arrow, and the arrows and the strings had to be coordinated. So once you used up your arrows, you're out of luck. The Chinese army could not only share their arrows, but they could reclaim them and reuse them on the battlefield. War leads to the last area I want to look at in this sort of before industrial design, but using ID brain power stuff, and that's armor. All war equipment involves a balance of design and engineering, and I think looking at armor is a really great way to understand that. Throughout time and around the world, armor was really sophisticated. Putting a rigid metal shell around a human body involves an understanding of ergonomics, designing for the body and its movements, anthropometrics, measuring the body and using those measurements, and also really sophisticated material use. Roman armor was standardized, which allowed or even required the separation of design and making. So it was all figured out and they made multiples of all the parts and then they put them together on their soldiers. That's thinking that we're going to look at much later. The idea of separating out design and making is what happened after the Industrial Revolution, and it's what required the birth of industrial design. So there's certainly evidence of some of those aspects of what we do really long time ago. Armor shows a marriage of form and function in a really exciting way. We think of ergonomics as something that became part of the design conversation in the 1940s during World War II. We think of the Aeron chair or the Good Grips peeler as early examples of designs that really care about the physical limitations of the user. But you can't put a human hand in a metal sleeve that can still move and grip without really understanding how that hand works. And on the right is armor that's meant to look like a blousey sleeve, like a tied fabric sleeve, but those separate puffs, there's probably a technical term in apparel design for those, the puffs, also allow movement because they're each separate parts and they're attached with pins. So the aesthetic of this is related to the function as well. These videos are taken from Sean Belair's Instagram and he works in the arms and armor department at the Met. So if you're interested in armor, following him on Instagram is a, a real satisfaction. When armor was made for presentation as much as for protection, which it was for important people, for kings who might not be fighting in the battle but were going to be battle adjacent and certainly parade present the design knob gets turned way up. This armor is not so much about function, but it's doing a lot more. It's saying stuff to us. And isn't that what makes us interested in design today? Not just what does it do, but what does it tell me? What does it tell me about the person using it, about their taste level, about their economic situation? And that's really evident in armor. Also, armor investigates form in a way that not many designed objects did, and with a sort of boldness that almost nothing else did. If I were in battle and someone wearing a, a shell on their head or a crazy Muppet monster on their head came towards me, I wouldn't even want to fight them. I would want to just go back with them. Clearly their culture is better than mine. They have more stuff figured out than I ever will. There's a whole sort of cultural export in the forms of armor. The entirety of a culture's artistic expression can be found in some armor. Is armor merely protection, or is it a form of export, or a form of education? Are we learning about other cultures by looking at them and how they've clad themselves in metal? Just from these subas, which are a disc that goes at the top of the sword hilt, you can understand everything about the sophisticated brilliance of Japanese metallurgy and metalwork, the idea that they, as an island nation, are influenced by nature and water themes, the balanced asymmetry of so much Japanese work is right here in these metal pieces. There's so much thought and care and craft in these pieces that I find them really rewarding to examine. So that's it. This was short, 40 slides to support one simple declarative statement. There's lots of evidence of the same problem solving that we now call industrial design, but a really long time ago. That's it. The relationship between engineering and design is a complicated gray zone. And I think some of my students struggle to figure out their place in that gray zone. You can figure out for yourself 
what you need industrial design to be, how you define it, and which parts of what I've shown you belong there and why. So that's it. Take a break. Have some ice cream. Practice jumping rope. Tune back in. There's one more chapter this week, which is the royal patronage system and how everything we made on the planet was pretty much made either for all of us to use in our daily lives, super utilitarian, or super fancy for wealthy kings. Okay, see you later. I can, I can wear this hat. This is not going to work. This whole thing in my pocket. Is somebody mowing their lawn at midnight? <laughs>